This is lesson 6.2, the normal distribution and z-scores. We're going to be talking about something really important today, z-score table, and we're going to see that it plays a large role in the next four or so lessons. Um, and so I will describe it in detail when we get to an example that requires it, but just um, this is a quick glimpse of it. It's just a table full of a whole bunch of different numbers and you'll be able to read the table by intersecting uh, columns and rows to find the appropriate number for what we're working on. And again, more details on that when it's appropriate. In the meantime, here is today's note. Um, so, first couple paragraphs are just a recap of some of the things we've learned already. Remember, a frequency polygon is a segmented line that joins the midpoints of the top of each column in a frequency histogram, and it approximates the shape of a probability density distribution. So it gives us an idea of what a distribution looks like visually. Also, um, we talked about continuous random variables in the last lesson. Um, we have to use a range of values to determine theoretical probability for continuous random variables because unlike discrete variables where you can count them 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, anything that's continuous can be broken down into infinitesimally small units. So we have to just say, well, we're going to go, say, between 5 and 10 or between 1 and 2, whatever. In other words, we have to give a range and then anything that falls in that range goes in that interval. So for the range 1 and 2, maybe it's times for something. Maybe something takes 1.2 seconds. Another thing takes 1.7 seconds. But both of them would fall in that interval of 1 to 2, for example. Probability that a continuous random variable takes on any single value is 0. Now that was an important concept as well. So I'll highlight that. The idea being that while it is theoretically possible for a continuous random variable to take a specific value, our denominator, because our denominator is all possible values, and all possible values in this case for a continuous variable are infinite, it works out that, that theoretically... Um, the probability is going to be zero for any one value of the variable. All right, so that's a, that's a bit of review. Here's one more thing I guess I should talk about, remind you of. Normal distribution is a probability distribution around a central value dropping off symmetrically to the right and left, forming a bell-like shape. So the shape of a bell curve or the shape of a normal distribution looks like this you know, within my limited artistic abilities. That's not good. Let's try it again. Make it to look a little bit more symmetrical. Mm, all right, that'll have to do. Anyway, so <clears throat> it's symmetrical and it's got a bell-like shape. Okay, let's, let's take a look at a couple of examples. A soft drink company bottles its products in 500 mil containers. The table shows the frequency distribution for a sample of 200 bottles. All right, so on the right we see this table, and it's the volume. We're measuring the volume of these bottles. So everyone's seen a 500 mil bottle of Coke or whatever. <clears throat> volume is a continuous variable, right? Um, I don't. Well, I can count, you know, 499 mils, 500 mils, things like that. It's still, it also makes sense to talk about 499 and a half mils or 499 and three quarter mils. So I can, I can break that volume down. So that makes this a continuous variable. Um, <clears throat> so we got a table. This is a, one of these tables where we've got the data pre-grouped for us. So you can see that the lowest uh, value on the table is a bottle that contains or a range of volumes between 490 and 492. And the frequency for the sample, because they, they, they took a sample, in other words, they did some quality control, someone grabbed 200 bottles off the line 
and measured them. And of those 200 bottles, none of them fell in the range of 490 to 492. But that was our interval. Then they did the next interval, 492 to 494. And again, they didn't find any that fell in that range. Okay, that's fine. 494 to 496, well, they found two bottles in that range. And then, and so on. And 496 to 498, they found 11. <clears throat> then you can you can see the numbers for the frequency going up until you get the maximum around 500 mils, which is what the bottles are supposed to be. And then it falls off again as we get above 500 mils. So the first few rows of the table represent underfilled bottles. The last few rows represent overfilled bottles. But, you know, there's, again, there's some variation. That's how things work in the real world. <clears throat> so use the table to determine the probability that a given bottle will contain less than 500 mils. All right. Um, well, if we want to do the probability, then what we need to do is we need to, um, we need to find out, compare the frequency of a particular interval with the with the overall quantity of bottles sampled. We know that was 200 again, right? So 200 bottles, highlight that or underline that. So if zero bottles uh, had, a, had a volume between 490 and 492, then to get the probability of one of those 200 bottles that we pulled being in that range is zero divided by 200. And so there is a relative frequency of 0. So 0 out of 200 times equals 0. So the next one, 0 out of 200, again, would be 0. For the next one, it's 2 out of 200. Oops, I should have put 200 here, <clears throat> which equals 0 0.01. So the relative frequency is 0 0.01 or 1%. In other words, 1% of the bottles sampled fell in the range 494 to 496. So if 1% of the bottles sampled fell in this range, we can turn that around and say there's a 1% probability that we're going to get one in that range because they're related to each other. And then we just keep doing the same for all of these. It's easy, simple calculation. Divide the frequency in half and then move the decimal place over a couple. So that's just do that here. <clears throat> Guess I don't need an equal sign. So there's my relative frequency. <clears throat> All right. Well, now I've filled in the table, I've got relative frequency, and that, again, is going to relate to my probability. I can use that then to, to help me figure out the answers to some of these questions. Use the table to determine the probability, relative frequency, that a given bottle will contain less than 500 mils. All right, well, less than 500 mils would be any of... Those ones there that I put the red bracket beside, right? Basically, that's a range from 490 mils to 500 mils. The probability that that's going to happen is going to be the sum of all the probabilities. If we go back to our rule of sum, so we're going to add them all up. So it's going to be, you know, zero from the first row, right? This zero here plus the next zero plus the next number, which was 0 0.01, and so on, plus 0 0.055, plus 0 0.215. So in other words, these ones here that I've highlighted in yellow in the right-hand column, those are the probabilities that go with each of those intervals, we just add them all up. Okay, let's get rid of this. I don't think I want to have that highlighted anymore. And when I add them all up, I get a probability. It comes up to, to 0.28 or 28% if 
I want to write it as a percent. <clears throat> so there's a 28% probability that you're going to grab a bottle between, well, it's less than 500 anyway. Let's put it that way. What's the probability that it will be between 498 and 502? Inclusive. All right, so I'll just use a different color here. 498 to 502 is just those two rows there. So we can do the same thing. We can just add the probabilities together. So in this case, it's um, going to be 0 0.215 plus 0 0.405. And that gives me 0 0.62 or 62%. Again, that's straddling the 500 mil mark, which is where we're supposed to be aiming for when we fill up these bottles, assuming I'm you know, putting myself in the place of the soft drink bottler then I'm aiming to get 500, so I would expect that most of the bottles should fall close to 500 uh, mils, and it does, right? We got 62% uh, of them falling within two mils of that 500 mil. What's the probability that it is exactly 500 mils? Well, we know that this is a continuous variable, and we also know that continuous variables have probabilities of zero for any one value so so that's kind of a trick question but not really it's just checking to see if you know if you remember that <clears throat> sketch a scatter plot of the frequency versus the volume using the midpoint of each interval all right so i need the midpoint of the intervals we've done this before when we did weighted means or group means um so let's just grab the midpoint or do a midpoint column here just to make things easier. So the midpoint between 490 and 492 is, of course, 491. And then the midpoint between 492 and 494 is 493. And since the intervals go up by twos, then the midpoints are going to go up by twos as well. So again, pretty easy to, once you get on a roll, to know what numbers go in here. I mean, you should, of course, check. I'm just writing them all down right now, but then I'll just take a glance over at my volume column to make sure that I didn't mess anything up. But no, the midpoints look good. So I got my midpoints. And so to save some time as far as this lesson goes, I went ahead and put the scales and labels on the on the graph. So we were, the first one was to do a frequency versus volume um, graph here. So in other words, we are using the midpoint that I just calculated on the horizontal axis. And we are doing the frequency, which is the second column, on the vertical axis. <clears throat> and so then you 0, 0, 2, 11, and so on. All right, so let's just do this graph up quick. So at 491, we had 0, 0. Uh, 2 would be, again, I'm estimating a little bit here, right? So 2, that dot should be about there. 11. What else did I have? 43, 81, 48. Fourteen one zero. All right, there's my dots. You know, there's my ordered pairs from the table, taking the appropriate numbers. If I connect the dots, what I've got here is what looks like a bell curve. It looks like a normal distribution. <coughs> All right, so that is volume midpoint versus the frequency. Let's do the volume versus the relative frequency. So again, I've got the setup. So it's got the same mid, we're using the midpoints, the midpoint volumes again, but this time instead of doing the overall frequency, we're going to do it compared to the relative frequency, the decimals in the third column now, which is why I've put different scale on my vertical axis. 
but what we're going to find is, you know, we still have ordered pairs, and we still have 0 and 0 and uh, what was the next one? 0 0.01. So I've got to be careful with my decimals here. So again, just slightly above the x-axis. Uh, 0 0.55 0 0.215 405 0 0.24 0 0.07 0 0.005 and 0 connect the dots And again, we have got ourselves a normal distribution. In fact, we've got the exact same normal distribution. It's the same shape, isn't it? Not just relatively the same, but exactly the same. And the reason why it's the exact same is because um, all we did was change the scale on the vertical axis. One was frequency, number of times things occurred, and the other was basically probability. Relative frequency, again, is going to be the same as probability, and they're very closely related to each other. Frequency and probability are just, you know, they, they're, they're tightly connected, these two concepts. So, um, so the shapes are the same, and that's what you're supposed to notice to answer about, uh, about uh, for the last part. What do you notice about each of the graphs? They both have the same distribution. And that distribution is normal, bell-shaped. Distribution. <clears throat> All right, so there's our normal distribution. So just to end, how we can use relative frequency to help us calculate probability. Now is where we get to, we only have one more example, but uh, this is where we have to start thinking about z-scores. We learned about z-scores in a previous lesson, but we didn't do much with them. Just remember, or let me remind you, that a z-score is a measure of how many standard deviations a particular value is away from the mean, okay? So, the z-score formula, if I want to do it over here, was uh, x minus mu, if I'm doing it for the population, over sigma? Yes. Sorry, I'm just going by memory. That was the population ver version. For the sample version, it was the same relationship, just different variables. So for the sample, the z-score equaled x minus x bar over s for uh, for our standard deviation, sample standard deviation. Okay, so that's what the z-score is. What we can do is we can use z-scores for normal distributions to estimate probabilities. So... Obviously, we need to have the mean and the standard deviation in order to do this, though. So that's what part A is getting us to do. You determine the mean and the standard deviation for of distance kicks out. Well, I didn't read the example yet. Kevin is trying out for school football team, right? He wants to see how far he can kick the ball. So what does he do? He, of course, does a scientific trial about it. Who wouldn't, right? So he does 20 kicks, measures each one of them so that he can figure out his mean and standard deviation kick because the coach is going to ask him for that for sure. So how do we calculate that? Well, of course, we can add them all together and divide and we can use the, uh, we can use a long formula that you learned in a previous lesson to calculate standard deviation. But remember, we also learned an easier way of doing this. So I'm going to get you to show you this easier way, except all of a sudden my iPad stand is 
gone wonky on me. Hmm. Alright. I'm setting this up against my room. I just want to show you how I take it in again. So bear with me here. Okay, so I'm going to show you my camera again. Um, <clears throat> and I'm going to just type stuff into my calculator quickly so I can again show you how to do this. Get settled in front of this. Okay, this is my calculator and it's got a stat function on it. Remember, I press second stat to put it in stat mode and then I enter data. So the first piece of data was 17. So I'd type in 17 and then for me I'd click the store button by my right thumb, STO, and it says n equals 1. So I've entered that first piece of data. And then the next one, if I go horizontally, was 27, store. And then the next one was 31, store, right? So there were 20, so I'm just going to quickly type those in. So I'm going to take my calculator away again where I can more easily do that. So 25, 25, 44, 35, 24, 31, 48, 42, 48, 45, 34, 41, 38, 40, 43, 45, and 21. So I've entered all the pieces of data here and just bring the screen back so you can see it. So it says n equals 20. And if I want to get the mean now, well, first of all, remember what I need to keep in mind is what, population or, or sample. On, as far as mean goes, it's exactly the same. So my calculator doesn't have mu for population mean. It just has x bar, but x bar is above this bracket, uh, the left-hand bracket, and I get 35.2 for my mean. And I'll write that down in a second. And then to get my standard deviation, now my calculator does have differentiate between population and sample standard deviation. Above the time sign, you see, uh, you see uh, Sx, and above the divide sign, you see mu, no, sigma x, and uh, so the times one is the sample standard deviation, the divide one is the population standard deviation, so I'll use the one above the divide, and um, there it is, I got 9.33. Alright, so again, you can see how it, how it uh, is typed in, and it saves you a lot of time when you learn how to do that. So let's go back, write those numbers in. <clears throat> And then we can carry on and actually use the z-score table. So I said that mu was equal to 35.2. That's the mean, the population mean. And sigma was equal to 9.33. That's the standard deviation. For both of these, it's the population. Okay, so we need those to calculate the z-score, as you can see by the formulas I've written over on the side. Okay, so the next question, what is the z-score for a kick that went 40 yards? All right, so here we've already got our normal distribution shape here. We don't have any values on it, <clears throat> but we can certainly fill in some things. So just to get a, an idea of what's going on, um, then we can see that the middle, remember that the mean is always found at the, the mean, median, and mode actually are always found at the middle, uh, the highest point of a normal distribution. So 35.2 right here in the middle is where the mean is going to be found for this for this sample or for this for this set of data. Remember these different lines here, like this one, 
is one standard deviation below. So that would be um, minus one standard deviation, which is equal to, so we're going to take away 9.33. So 35.2 minus 9.33. gives me 25.8. And then this line here was one standard deviation above. And again, this isn't to specifically answer the question. This is just to get you oriented. That. So that says plus one, sigma. So again, if you're looking at this and wondering what the heck is he writing, that's supposed to, this is supposed to say plus one, sigma. This is supposed to say minus one, sigma. Minus one from what? minus one from the mean. In fact, maybe I should even write that in there. So mu minus one, mu plus one, and this itself is mu. All right. And so if I take the, st the mean and add nine, the standard deviation to it, um, 35.2 plus 9.33, I get about 44.5. And then I could keep going, right? This one here would be two standard deviations above, and this line on the far right is three standard deviations above. Down here on the left is two standard deviations below, and this last one that I just put a mark on was three standard deviations below. So again, this is specific to this data set, and it gives us an idea of how things are spread out. We saw some data concerning how things are spread out. Let's just go back to that for a second, if I can remember where it was. Uh, I think it's here. Let's see. No, I gotta go to here. Here it is. So the normal distribution and population, right? So remember that we have the mean in the middle and then 68% of data is within one standard deviation, and 95% of data is within two standard deviations of the mean, and 99.7% of data is within three standard deviations of the mean. And that's for a normal distribution only, though. This only applies to the normal distribution. So... That's a recap. How does that fit in with our specific data here? Well, a kick that went 40 yards would fall somewhere around here, right? I'll do that in red so it jumps out a little bit more. So here's 40 yards. So we got the average kick went 35.2 yards. One standard deviation above that would be 44.5 yards. In other words, it's not that uncommon for them to hit them, to kick them as far as 44.5 yards. We want to find out what's the probability, well, eventually we'll want to find the probability that he kicked it 40 yards or less or more. Um, so first we have to get the Z score. So the Z score tells us, again, Z equals... Um, x minus mu over sigma. And so 40 is our x, the particular piece of data we're looking at. Mu was 35.2, and sigma was 9.33. Work all that out, and you get 0 0.51. Okay, well, what does that mean? What it means is that that's approximately half a standard deviation. So a kick of 40 yards is half a standard deviation above the mean. I'm going to do SD for standard deviation. And we can see that visually here, right? We can see where the mean is represented in the middle, and we can see that 40 is to the right of it, above it. Okay, great. So what? Now what do we do with it? Well, now what we can do is we can use that to answer part C. What's the probability that he's going to kick a ball 40 yards or less? This is where the Z-score table comes in. 
All right, so we want to find the probability that x is less than or equal to 40. So for that, we refer to our z-score table. We keep this number in mind here, the z-score of 0 0.51. And let's go to the z-score table, and now I'll explain that. So a z-score table gives us probabilities to do with normal distributions. At the top here, they describe it as table entry for z is the area under the standard normal curve to the left of z. So to the left, that's an important idea here. So it's always to the left. Notice how in the, in the diagram, they've shown a random line labeled z, and they shaded in the area to the left of it. So the z-score will give us the area, basically the shaded in area. But the shaded in area is directly related to probability. So the bigger the shaded in area, the greater the probability that something's going to occur, or not occur if it's smaller. All right. So remember, z-scores are always based on, they're measured compared to the mean. So if the mean here is right in the middle, then anything to the left of that dotted red line I just drew is going to have a negative z-score, right? Anything to the left of that line is a negative z-score. And so, actually, I'll come back to the table, because that's the f one side, of, one part of the table. Then I go to the, the other, this is the back, if this is a printout, and I recommend you probably should print this out, this z-score table. Um, and you'll have a, a separate a separate tab for this in OneNote where you can grab this table. Notice how in the back here, the shaded area looks bigger, and it's going to deal with any z-scores that are greater than the mean, and so therefore we're going to have a bigger area, and we're going to have a greater probability. Okay? So if you're still lost, it's okay. We're just, we're going to get there eventually. We have basically along this top row here and this column here, those are just have to do with their z-score readings. Our actual probabilities, areas, start right here. This is a probability. And then we can read it going this way, and then once we get to the end of this row here, then we loop back and go back to this row, and then we can go across and go across. So we can start with a probability or area of 0 0.0003. So change to a percent, that's 0.03%. As you can see, the numbers are going up, going up, going up, until you get to um, I just sorry, I want to take that back. One, I don't want to. I, I can't edit this out. So uh, is a small thing I want to take back. We're not starting at that corner. In this case, we're starting here in this corner, which is the lowest one. And the reason why I'm starting there is because of the nature of negative numbers. The more negative something is, um, the, the less the probability is. So we're actually going to start in the right-hand corner here. And again, my bad. Uh, I would edit it out if I was a better uh, video editor and just jump straight to the correct uh, lesson here, but I can't. So anyway, we're going to start there. We're going to go this way. But anyway, it's the exact same concept that I just talked about. You'll notice the numbers are getting bigger and bigger. So it starts at 0.02% until we get all the way down to this corner here, which is exactly 50%. And then if we go over to the, to the back of the table, then we start up again here in the left-hand corner, and then we continue to go this way, the way I originally went to the right from here, and the numbers are continuing to grow again. Now we're going to the right and then down to the right, until we get all the way down to this corner here, which is 99.98%. Um, in other words, uh, that would be almost the entire area under the normal distribution shaded in. It would also mean a probability associated with it of 99.98%, almost 100% probability associated with it. Okay, so let's put these components together and see if I can make some sort of sense out of them. So I'm just going to erase a little bit of this mess I've made, and I'll show you exactly how to read the z-score table now. 
race, race, race. All right. So we said our Z score was 0 0.51. So we have to pay attention to the sign, negative or positive. This entire side of the, of the table has got negative numbers. Where am I getting these negative numbers from? I'm starting by reading down this column, okay? Negative numbers here. So I'm going to try to find 0 0.5, the first decimal, right? We wanted 0 0.51. Let me just write it here, negative 0 0.51. So I'm going to start by just looking for this 0, uh, 0.5, and it wasn't negative, it was positive. So 0 0.51. And so I'm going to try to find 0 0.5, just that part, down that first left column for Z. And I'm not going to find it on this side of the page because, as I pointed out, everything's negative here. So then I go over to the next page, and I keep going, and I'm looking down here until I get to 0 0.5, and then I, you know, I stop. Well, 0 0.5 is right here. Okay, so that, that lets me find my row. So the first decimal place along with the positive or negative sign lets me find my row. Now to find the specific number within my row, that's where I'm going to look at the second number in my z-score. So rewrite that again, 0 0.5. Now the second number is this one. That's where I go across the top here, and in particular I want 0 0.01 for this one. So if I add these two things together, 0 0.5 plus 0 0.01, I get 0 0.51. In other words, I've taken, the, I've honed in on the exact number I want in the table of 0 0.51. Where this column and this row intersect, right here, represents, or is the number for the area under the curve for a z-score of that value which also corresponds to the probability. So, putting it all together, the probability that a z-score of 5.1 is going to occur is going to be the area under here, which is 0.695 or 69.5%, which corresponds to a probability of 69.5%. And notes. So the probability from the z-score table is 0 0.6950. There are four decimal places on the table, so I'm just copying them all down, or 69.5%. Okay, so to show that on the graph without some of the other stuff messing it up, we had the mean here of 35.2. We had the specific value of 40, which we saw was somewhere in here, not quite one full um, standard deviation above the mean. We wanted to use our z-score able to help us find the area under this part of the curve, which would correspond to the probability of him kicking the ball 40 yards or less, and that turned out to be 69.5%. So to take a long example and sum it up, it turns out that Kevin has a 69.5% probability of kicking a ball 40 yards or less based on the data he collected. What's the probability that he's going to kick a ball a distance greater of 40, greater than 40 yards? Well, as far as the graph goes, things are going to look exactly the same. We still have the same mean. We still have the same number that we're looking at here. It's still a 40-yard uh, distance. The only thing that's changing is rather than looking at less than 40 yards or 40 yards or less, we want a different part of the graph. We want to see this part that I've shaded in um, corresponds to kicks that were greater than 40 yards, right? 40 yards, 41 yards, 42 yards, whatever. Our, our z-score table doesn't deal with anything, any graphs that look like this. We'll never see the shaded in area on the right. 
Never, never, never will we see the shaded in area on the right. Let's look back at our Z score table for a second to confirm this. You can see the shaded in area is on the left. You can see the Z the shaded in area is on the left here. It's never on the right hand side of the graph. But we've seen there's workarounds for this as well. And the workaround is that 100% represents all of something, so we can always just, if we know one portion of it, like if we know the area to the left of something, then we can get the area to the right by subtracting it from 1. So what I want to say is, I, what's the probability that x is greater than 40? Notice how I use the or less than for less than, or for the part c, that is the way z-score tables are set up. I only want to use the greater than without the or equals to uh, sign for showing that it's greater than 40. And if there's a 69.5% prob probability that Kevin is going to kick the ball 40 yards or less, then there must be 1 minus 0 0.6950 or 0 0.305 or 30.5% probability that he's going to kick it greater than 40 yards. So, it makes sense again. What's the probability that Nick will kick a ball a distance between 24 and 40 yards? Okay, last example, but now that we've got all the parts, we should be able to do it kind of, hopefully, quicker. Although there is one last twist thrown in here. <clears throat> Let's start with our graph. Always start with a picture, okay? Draw your bell curve, mark your mean on it, mark the actual value or values that you want to measure on here, and then you have a visual. So we want between 24 and 40 yards. So 24 is somewhere, let's see, what did we say back up here? We said one standard deviation below was 25.8. So 24 is even below that. So 24 is somewhere down here. And 40, we already got that one. That was up here. Not quite a standard deviation above. We want to find the area between these two uh, lines, and we're going to use Z scores again to do it. Once we've got the standard deviation and the mean, the and then we use our z-score table, the calculations are actually very easy. Um, so what we want is the probability that x is greater than 24, or less than or equal to 40, How are we going to do that? Well, we're going to do that by actually do, looking at the z-score table for two different things. If we take this graph here and break it down, we know that z-scores, again, only do things to the left of the line we want. So if we break this down, this 24 part, actually, let's start with the bigger one. So this, if I ignore the greater than 24 part, it's just this shaded area here, right? And so that's my 40, and we already have a, an answer for this when we found that that was 0.695 from a previous question. But that takes us all the way down to the bottom. I want to find out the probability or the area from the 24 down to the bottom. So 24 was down here. And if I take that and get the z-score associated with that, which I don't currently know, I'll have to calculate. If I subtract the areas, then what's going to happen is when I subtract this area from here, it's going to knock that little chunk out, and it's going to look like the area I've shaded in green, right? So basically, I have to find the probability of the higher number, find the probability of the lower number and subtract them, and then I'll have the probability between the two numbers. So that's mathematically what we have to do. So this probability that I've expressed above 
is going to become rewritten as the probability that x is less than or equal to 40 minus the probability that x is less than or equal to 24. We already know the probability that it's less than 40, 0 0.6950. And as an aside here, <coughs> I'll do, I'll calculate the z score when x was 24, so 24 minus 35.2 over 9.33, that equals negative 1.20 approximately. Well, now we've got this negative z score, which makes sense because we're looking at this one I've highlighted in blue. This number is 24 is less than the mean. It's below the mean. So it's 24 is 1.2 standard deviations below the mean. So now we'll look for that on the z score table. And so again, if we're looking for negative 1.2 or 1.20, then I look down the columns, and this time I'm going to look on the negative side until I find negative 1.2, which is here. And then I look for the second decimal, which was the 0. right? And I go across the top to find the 0, so that would be the very first one beside it. So the intersection of these two would be at 0 0.1151. What does that mean? 11.5% of the area uh, is under that curve. That means there's 11.5% probability that a kick is going to go less than 24 yards. So stick that in here, 0 0.1151. When I subtract them, 0 0.5799, or about 58%. So there's about a 58% probability that Kevin's ball will go between 24 and 40 yards. That was a long and grueling lesson. Thank you for if you stuck with me this long, um, because you know I I appreciate it, and it's also going to help you though um, because we're going to need to use this Z score concept uh, for the next few lessons, and so you're going to have to know it, and so your diligence will have paid off. <laughs>